talking about the kingdom of God. I invite you to hear the word of God. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You've probably heard a sermon on the mustard seed before. I've preached more than one myself, and I just like the story. I mean, the tiny mustard seed is about the size of a the head of a pin. And Jesus tells us that this is still the greatest of all seeds because it, it will grow into the greatest of all, did you catch it? Shrubs. <laughs> Do you think Jesus had a sense of humor? I, mean, I think so. The greatest of all shrubs. I mean, the kingdom of God becomes like the greatest of all shrubs. I mean, you expect Jesus to say something else. The kingdom of God is like something grand and glorious and remarkable. Like in Ezekiel, where he says... The Lord promises to build a tree, a cedar tree, a tall and lofty tree on the top of a mountain, and all the birds of the air will rest in it. And Daniel, he dreams of a tree that grows from the center of the earth all the way up into heaven, and all the animals will find shade there. But the kingdom of God is like a shrub. <laughs> a shrub. I mean, you can hear Jesus stifling a laugh, maybe, when he tells us the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows into a shrub. So the sermons I've preached and the ones you've heard before are right. From small beginnings come great things. But the parallel truth is that the kingdom of God comes to us surprisingly, maybe even laughingly sometimes, like a shrub. The kingdom comes to us often in pedestrian and ordinary and unspectacular ways. So the kingdom of God comes from small beginnings from the unsophisticated, less than the triumphant, shall we say, from humble origin. You could start with Jesus for that. He's born in a barn. He lives his entire life in this tiny nation that's at the edge of the known world, this Palestinian backwater, before mass communication. But more people know the name of Jesus than know the name of the emperor of Rome, who was ruler when he was born. And it's the same thing with the church. This tiny shrub of a movement begins, as one scholar put it, with one beggar telling another where to find bread. And it becomes this movement that remakes the Roman Empire. And it's outlasted the Roman Empire for 1,500 years. I mean, who would have thought that? And the church maybe seems to be under threat now, you know, with numbers decreasing and all kinds of things. But the church will survive as it has for these last 2,000 years, even in times of persecution. But let's think about the shrubs growing closer to home. I was talking with one of our church folks recently. You've been feeding their family lately because of one of those illnesses that takes such a toll. You have no idea, she said, what it means when someone shows up at your door with a meal prepared. You deacon people do great work, and while most of the dishes you prepare probably do not include mustard, Nonetheless, they most certainly are what the kingdom of God is about. Vacation Bible school is coming, and it will be crazy. 60, 70 kids, about that many staff members, high octane energy level, mustard, there's mustard seeds and shrubs all over the place here. Who knows what moment will be the kingdom moment for one of those kids with the Bible study that they, that they do with the, the little art project that they take home to their mom. When something, someone gently bandages their ouchie that they got while falling on the concrete, will they come home singing some song about the kingdom of God that they'll remember all their lives? Who knows? We may not know. We may never know. But of such things are the kingdom of God is all about. Speaking of kids at the alternative Christmas market, you give a fair amount of money for Alvin Dunn School. And every second Sunday, you bring food 
for the kids at Allen Dunn School. That's not so far from here in terms of miles, but it's light years away for at least some of them in terms of standard of living. The cereal, the vegetables, the mac and cheese that you provide for those kids there feeds them over the weekend where they might not get so much. You know, the year started with 30 some kids. Now there's 92, I think, kids that are fed by you each and every weekend. Mustard seed, shrub, the kingdom of God. And now we're living in this tense, divided nation in which people on all sides of the political spectrum are angry. But it's not doing us any good to demonize people who think differently than we do. And all people, of all people, followers of Jesus shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. After all, we're the ones who think the image of God is to be found in each and every face. So what would happen if each of us continues to advocate for our opinions, continues to stand up for what we believe loudly and strongly, but stop short, far short, of demonizing people who don't share our opinions and convictions. What good would that do in this great sea of media where there's a great reward for antagonism and anger from every angle? What good could it possibly do? Maybe nothing. But who knows? Who knows? We're serving the God whose kingdom starts with mustard seeds and shrubs. And the kingdom like those shrubs, always seems to find a way to grow. So my money's on the kids at Alvin Dunn School and our vacation Bible school. My money's on our American institutions with, from the courts to the media to the government, filled with flawed people, as they are, but my money's on the institutions to bring us through this crisis as they have for the last 200 and some years. My money's on the mustard seeds that Jesus plants that's how the kingdom of God has always worked. Will it do any good? Will the kingdom of God grow among us? Who knows? All I know is that I stopped betting against Jesus a long time ago. So this is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. And blessed Father's Day to all of you who are remembering your fathers with love today. About five years ago, a book came out by Mark Schreiber about his father, Sergeant Schreiber. Now, Sergeant Trevor was never elected to public office, though he tried a few times. He married into the Kennedy family, which, you know, doesn't get you any credit in and of itself. <laughs> uh, but he and Eunice share credit for a lot of things, like the Special Olympics, which became not just a national, but an international cause uh, because of the two of them. And he and Eunice share credit for what, by all accounts, was a, a happy and loving marriage for 56 years with five kids. He was cherished and respected and loved by all five of his kids. Cheering their achievements, standing by them and their failures, which were very public since he was, after all, married to a Kennedy. He was the founding director of the Peace Corps, the architect of much of the war on poverty in the 60s, ambassador to France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether you buy into his politics or not, Sergeant Schreiber was a doer. He got things done. And when he died at age 94, his son Mark, Notice that over and over again, people would tell him, your father was a good man. At first, he thought it was a cliche, something people were just sort of saying to make him feel better. But so many people said it, he started to give it more thought. A senator called him a good man. Ms. Wilson, who had been the waitress at his regular lunch spot for 35 years, said, your dad was a good man. His assistant, Jean, worked with him for 33 years, partly because he would always listen to her opinions. Didn't always agree with them, but he always listened. He was a very good man, she said. Brad Blank, a childhood friend of Mark's, told of the encouraging letters that Sergeant Shriver had written him. Your dad was a good man. Calvin, the neighborhood garbage collector, stopped his morning route, came over, took his gloves off, and with a tear coming out of his eye, shook Mark Shriver's hand and said, your father was a good, good man. So Mark wrote a book about his father, seeking to discover how his father did it, how he managed to treat people the same, whether they served in the United States Senate or collected his trash. 
how it was that his father came to be the person that he was. And you'll not be surprised to know that he called his book a good man. I heard Mark Shriver interviewed on the radio. He talked about the difference between being great and being good. There are great people, he noted, that you would not want to have dinner with. The great man is recognized for his achievements, he said. The good man can be great in that arena, too, but even greater at home, on the sidewalk, at the diner, with his grandkids, at the supermarket, at church, wherever human interaction requires integrity and compassion. Dad was good because he was great in the smaller, unseen corners of life. I heard that interview and I immediately thought of the parable of the mustard seed. How important the habits of virtue, the daily practice of character, are in fatherhood, for all of us who are in that role, and for all of us who are seekers and sharers of the kingdom of God. So today, I challenge myself and all of us fathers out there, no matter how old our children may be, to be good men. To be good men. Our kids need us to be providers, certainly. They need us to be sources of advice. But most of all, they need us to be good. When I heard Mark Shriver talking about his father, not as perfect, not on a pedestal, because of the book, he points out his faults as well as his good things. But, but when he talks about him simply as a good man, I thought, what more would any of us want our children to say about us than my father was a good man? What better thing to be remembered for after we're gone than that? So my fellow dads, what will it take for us, for our kids, to say that of us? And you know, it's only a short hop, a tiny skip, and a little jump to say that this is what the kingdom of God is all about. And indeed, Mark Schreiber, when his search for what it was that made his father the good man that he was, he found that his father's faith was the foundation of his goodness. He points out that... Sergeant Shriver, his dad, went to church every single day of his life. Not the Sundays, but every single day. Which sort of removes from any of us this excuse that I'm too busy for church. <laughs> but in his book, Mark Shriver names the guiding principles of his father's life. Whether your life looks like a cedar of Lebanon, or, or whether your life looks like a shrub, they will work for you. They are simple, humble, unspectacular truths. And the three principles are faith, hope, and love. If you want to plant seeds to grow the kingdom of God, or if you just want to be a good dad, that's the place to start. Faith, hope, and love. If you just try to go there, if you just try, and ladies, I hope you'll excuse me on Father's Day, if you just try, then you will be a good man. What more would you want? Pray with me. Lord, you don't so much need people who are great as you need people who are good. People who will live by faith. Live by hope. Live with love. So Lord, help us to do just that, for Christ's sake, for our own sakes, and for the world's sake. Amen.